Chapter 14 The Jane Guy was a fine-looking topsail schooner of 180 tons burden. She was unusually sharp in the bows, and on a wind in moderate weather, the fastest sailor I have ever seen. Her qualities, however, as a rough sea boat were not so good, and her drought of water was by far too great for the trade to which she was destined. For this peculiar service, a larger vessel, and one of a light proportionate drought is desirable, say a vessel of from 300 to 350 tons. She should be bark-rigged, and in other aspects of a different construction from the usual South Sea ships. It is absolutely necessary that she should be well-armed. She should have, say, ten or twelve-pound carronades, and two or three long twelves, with brass blunderbusses and watertight arm-chests for each top. Her anchors and cables should be of far greater strength than is required for any other species of trade, and... Above all, her crew should be numerous and efficient, not less for such a vessel as I have described, than fifty or sixty able-bodied men. The Jane Guy had a crew of thirty-five, all able seamen, besides the captain and mate, but she was not altogether as well armed or otherwise equipped as a navigator acquainted with the difficulties and dangers of the trade could have desired. Captain Guy was a gentleman of great urbanity of manner, and of considerable experience in the southern traffic, to which he had devoted a great portion of his life. He was deficient, however, in energy, and consequently in that spirit of enterprise which is here so absolutely requisite. He was part owner of the vessel in which he sailed, and was invested with discretionary powers to cruise in the South Seas for any cargo which might come most readily to hand. He had on board, as usual in such voyages, beads and looking-glasses, tender works, axes, hatchets, saws, adzes, planes, chisels, gouges, gimlets, files, spokeshaves, rasps, hammers, nails, knives, scissors, razors, needles, thread, crockery ware, calico trinkets, and other similar articles. The schooner had sailed from Liverpool on the 10th of July crossed the Tropic of Cancer on the 25th, in longitude 20 degrees west, and reached Sal, one of the Cape Verde Islands on the 29th, where she took in salt and other necessaries for the voyage. On the 3rd of August, she left the Cape Verdes and steered southwest, stretching over toward the coast of Brazil, so as to cross the equator between the meridians of 28 and 30 degrees west longitude. This is the course usually taken by vessels bound from Europe to the Cape of Good Hope, or by that route to the East Indies. By proceeding thus, they avoid the calms and strong contrary currents which continually prevail on the coast of Guinea, while in the end it is found to be the shortest track, as westerly winds are never wanting afterward by which to reach the Cape. It was Captain Guy's intention to make his first stoppage at Karugalan's land. I hardly know for what reason. On the day we were picked up, the schooner was off Cape St. Rock in longitude 31 degrees west, so that when found, we had drifted probably from north to south, not less than five and twenty degrees. On board the Jane Guy, we were treated with all the kindness our distressed situation demanded. In about a fortnight, during which time we continued steering to the southeast, with gentle breezes and fine weather, both Peters and myself recovered entirely from the effects of our late privation and dreadful sufferings, and we began to remember what had passed rather as a frightful dream from which we had been happily awakened than as events which had taken place in sober and naked reality. I have since found that this species of partial oblivion is usually brought about by sudden transition, whether from joy to sorrow or from sorrow to joy, the degree of forgetfulness being proportioned to the degree of difference in the exchange. Thus, in my own case, I now feel it impossible to realize the full extent of the misery which I endured during the days spent upon the hulk. The incidents are remembered, but not the feelings which the incidents elicited at the time of their occurrence. I only know that when they did occur, I then thought human nature could sustain nothing more of agony. We continued our voyage for some weeks without any incidents of greater moment than the occasional meeting with whaling ships, and more frequently with the black or right whale, 
so called in contradistinction to the spermaceti. These, however, were chiefly found south in the 25th parallel. On the 16th of September, being in the vicinity of Cape of Good Hope, the schooner encountered her first gale of any violence since leaving Liverpool. In this neighborhood, but more frequently to the south and east of the promontory, we were to the westward, and navigators have often to contend with storms from the northward, which rage with great fury. They always bring with them a heavy sea, and one of their most dangerous features is the instantaneous chopping round of the wind, an occurrence almost certain to take place during the greatest force of the gale. A perfect hurricane will be blowing at one moment from the northward or northeast, and in the next not a breath of wind will be felt in that direction, while from the southwest it will come out all at once with a violence almost inconceivable. A bright spot to the southward is the sure forerunner of the change, and vessels are thus enabled to take the proper precautions. It was about six in the morning when the blow came on with a white squall, and, as usual, from the northward. By eight it had increased very much, and brought down upon us one of the most tremendous seas I had then ever beheld. Everything had been made as snug as possible, but the schooner labored excessively, and gave evidence of her bad qualities as a sea-boat, pitching her forecastle under at every plunge, and with the greatest difficulty struggling up from one way before she was buried in another. Just before sunset the bright spot for which we had been on the lookout made its appearance in the southwest, and in an hour afterward we perceived the little head-sail we carried flapping listlessly against the mast. In two minutes more, in spite of every preparation, we were hurled on our beam-ends, as if by magic, and a perfect wilderness of foam made a clear breach over us as we lay. The blow from the southwest, however, luckily proved to be nothing more than a squall, and we had the good fortune to right the vessel without the loss of a spar. A heavy cross sea gave us great trouble for a few hours after this, but toward morning we found ourselves in nearly as good condition as before the gale. Captain Guy considered that he had made an escape a little less than miraculous. On the 13th of October we came in sight of Prince Edward's Island in latitude 46 degrees, 53 south longitude, 37 degrees, 46 east. Two days afterward we found ourselves near Possession Island, and presently passed the islands of Crozet, in latitude 42 degrees, 59 south longitude, 48 degrees east. On the 18th we made Karugalans, or Desolation Island, in the southern Indian Ocean, and came to anchor in Christmas Harbor, having four fathoms of water. This island, or rather group of islands, bears southeast from the Cape of Good Hope, and is distant therefrom nearly 800 leagues. It was first discovered in 1772 by the Baron de Kruglin, or Kruglin, a Frenchman, who, thinking the land to form a portion of an extensive southern continent, carried home information to that effect, which produced much excitement at the time. The government, taking the matter up, sent the Baron back in the following year for the purpose of giving his new discovery a critical examination, when the mistake was discovered. In 1777, Captain Cook fell in with the same group, and gave to the principal one the name of Desolation Island, a title which it certainly well deserves. Upon approaching the land, however, the navigator might be induced to suppose otherwise, as the sides of most of the hills from September to March are clothed with very brilliant verdure. This deceitful appearance is caused by a small plant resembling saxifrage, which is abundant, growing in large patches on a species of crumbling moss. Besides this plant, there is scarcely a sign of vegetation on the island, if we accept some coarse rank grass near the harbor, some lichen, and a shrub which bears resemblance to a cabbage shooting into seed, and which has a bitter and acrid taste. The face of the country is healy, although none of the hills can be called lofty. Their tops are perpetually covered with snow. There are several harbors, of which Christmas Harbor is the most convenient. It is the first to be met with on the northeast side of the island, after passing Cape Francois, which forms the northern shore, and, by its peculiar shape, serves to distinguish the harbor. Its projecting point terminates in a high rock, through which is a large hole forming a natural arch. 
The entrance is in latitude 48 degrees, 40 south. Longitude 69 degrees, 6 east. Passing in here, good anchorage may be found under the shelter of several small islands, which form a sufficient protection from all easterly winds. Proceeding on eastwardly from this anchorage, you come to Wasp Bay, at the head of the harbor. This is a small basin, completely landlocked, into which you can go with four fathoms, and find anchorage in from ten to three, with a hard clay bottom. A ship might lie here with her best bower ahead all the year round without risk. To the westward, at the head of Wasp Bay, is a small stream of excellent water, easily procured. Some seal of the fur and hair species are still to be found on Karugalans Island, and sea elephants abound. The feathered tribes are discovered in great numbers. Penguins are very plenty, and of these there are four different kinds. The royal penguin, so called from its size and beautiful plumage, is the largest. The upper part of the body is usually gray, sometimes of a lilac tint, the under portion of the purest white imaginable. The head is of a glossy and most brilliant black, and feet also. The chief beauty of plumage, however, consists in two broad stripes of gold color, which pass along from the head to the breast. The bill is long and either pink or bright scarlet. These birds walk erect with a stately carriage. They carry their heads high with their wings drooping like two arms, and, as their tails project from their body and align with the legs, the resemblance to a human figure is very striking, and would be apt to deceive the spectator at a casual glance or in the gloom of the evening. The royal penguins which we met with on Karugalan's land were rather larger than a goose. The other kinds are the macaroni, and the jackass, and the rookery penguin. These are much smaller, less beautiful in plumage, and different in other respects. Besides the penguin, many other birds are here to be found, among which may be mentioned sea hens, blue paterals, teal, ducks, port egmont hens, shags, cape pigeons, the nelly, sea swallows, terns, seagulls, mother carries chickens, mother carries geese, or the great petterel, and lastly the albatross. The great petterel is as large as the common albatross and is carnivorous. It is frequently called the break bones, or osprey petterel. They are not at all shy, and when properly cooked are palatable food. In flying, they sometimes sail very close to the surface of the water with the wings expanded without appearing to move them in the least degree, or make any exertion with them whatever. The albatross is one of the largest and fiercest in the South Sea birds. It is of the gall species and takes its prey on the wing, never coming on land except for the purpose of breeding. Between this bird and the penguin the most singular friendship exists. Their nests are constructed with great uniformity upon a plan concerted between the two species, that of the albatross being placed in the center of a little square formed by the nests of four penguins. Navigators have agreed in calling an assemblage of such encampments a rookery. These rookeries have been often described, but as my readers may not all have seen these descriptions, and as I shall have occasion hereafter to speak of the penguin and albatross, it will not be amiss to say something here of their mode of building and living. When the season for incubation arrives, the birds assemble in vast numbers, and for some days appear to be deliberating upon the proper course to be pursued. At length they proceed to action. A level piece of ground is selected, of suitable extent, usually comprising three or four acres, and situated as near the sea as possible, being still beyond its reach. The spot is chosen with reference to its evenness of surface, and that is preferred which is the least encumbered with stones. This matter being arranged, the birds proceed, with one accord and actuated apparently by one mind, to trace out with mathematical accuracy either a square or other parallelogram, as may best suit the nature of the ground, and of just sufficient size to accommodate easily all the birds assembled and no more. In this particular, seeming determined upon preventing the access of future stragglers who have not participated in the labor of the encampment. 
One side of the place thus marked out runs parallel with the water's edge, and is left open for ingress or egress. Having defined the limits of the rookery, the colony now began to clear it of every species of rubbish, picking up stone by stone, and carrying them outside of the lines, and close by them, so as to form a wall on the three inland sides. Just within this wall, a perfectly level and smooth walk is formed, from six to eight feet wide, and extending around the encampment, thus serving the purpose of a general promenade. The next process is to partition out the whole area into small squares exactly equal in size. This is done by forming narrow paths, very smooth, and crossing each other at right angles throughout the entire extent of the rookery. At each intersection of these paths, the nest of an albatross is constructed, and a penguin's nest in the center of each square. Thus every penguin is surrounded by four albatrosses, and each albatross by a like number of penguins. The penguin's nest consists of a hole in the earth, very shallow, being only just of sufficient depth to keep her single egg from rolling. The albatross is somewhat less simple in her arrangements, erecting a hillock about a foot high and two in diameter. This is made of earth, seaweed, and shells. On its summit she builds her nest. The birds take special care never to leave their nests unoccupied for an instant during the period of incubation, or indeed until the young progeny are sufficiently strong to take care of themselves. While the male is absent at sea in search of food, the female remains on duty, and it is only upon the return of her partner that she ventures abroad. The eggs are never left uncovered at all. While one bird leaves the nest, the other nestling in by its side. This precaution is rendered necessary by the thieving propensities prevalent in the rookery, the inhabitants making no scruple to purloin each other's eggs at every good opportunity. Although there are some rookeries in which the penguin and albatross are the sole population, yet in most of them a variety of oceanic birds are to be met with, enjoying all the privileges of citizenship, and scattering their nests here and there, wherever they can find room, never interfering, however, with the stations of the larger species. The appearance of such encampments, when seen from a distance, is exceedingly singular. The whole atmosphere just above the settlement is darkened with the immense number of albatross, mingled with the smaller tribes, which are continually hovering over it, either going to the ocean or returning home. At the same time, a crowd of penguins are to be observed, some passing to and fro in the narrow alleys, and some marching with the military struts so peculiar to them, around the general promenade ground which encircles the rookery. In short, survey it as we will, nothing can be more astonishing than the spirit of reflection evinced by these feathered beings, and nothing surely can be better calculated to elicit reflection in every well-regulated human intellect. On the morning after our arrival in Christmas Harbor, the chief mate, Mr. Patterson, took the boats, and, although it was somewhat early in the season, went in search of seal, leaving the captain and a young relation of his on a point of barren land to the westward, they having some business, whose nature I could not ascertain, to transact in the interior of the island. Captain Guy took with him a bottle, in which was a sealed letter, and made his way from the point on which he was set on shore toward one of the highest peaks in the place. It is probable that his design was to leave the letter on that height for some vessel which he expected to come after him. As soon as we lost sight of him, we proceeded, Peters and myself being in the mate's boat, on our cruise around the coast, looking for seal. In this business we were occupied about three weeks, examining with great care every nook and corner, not only of Karugalan's land, but of the several small islands in the vicinity. Our labors, however, were not crowned with any important success. We saw a great many fur seal, but they were exceedingly shy, and with the greatest exertions we could only procure three hundred and fifty skins in all. Sea elephants were abundant, especially on the western coast of the mainland, but these we killed only twenty, and this with great difficulty. On the smaller islands we discovered a good many of the hare seal, but did not molest them. 
We returned to the schooner on the 11th, where we found Captain Guy and his nephew, who gave a very bad account of the interior, representing it as one of the most dreary and utterly barren countries in the world. They had remained two nights on the island, owing to some misunderstanding on the part of the second mate in regard to the sending of a jolly boat from the schooner to take them off.